So we're starting this new series, which I, I think um, is always appropriate going into Thanksgiving to look back and to remember how much God has your best interest in mind. I always love to say this, God's best is always your best. It is, because that's who he is. He cares for his uh, children even when we don't understand it or when we think that he might not. And so uh, this morning, I wanna talk about worship and the limitedness, you know, the limitations of mankind. Because one of, the, one of the struggles that we have is we're not like God. We are so much more limited, and that causes us to struggle through life. In fact, let me take you all the way back to Genesis uh, chapter number three, you know, the Genesis story, and then all of a sudden, the temptation for Adam and Eve. And even in that, Adam and Eve struggle with this idea that, that Satan brings to them, is that you don't have to be limited. You can be more than you are. You, you don't have to look to God as the one who gives you life, supplies, does everything you know, for you in that sense. You, you can become that kind of person. And if you remember the, the, uh, the story, I mean, it's brilliant. The, the narrative is so brilliant because it's so simple, so straightforward, and yet it absolutely fits with all of us you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years later. Uh, we, we understand exactly this. Here's the temptation. Listen, look at the tree. God says, don't eat of the tree. But look at the tree. Isn't it beautiful? And they go, well, yeah, I mean, it is beautiful. And look at the fruit. Doesn't it look delicious? Well, of course. I mean, who could, could say don't eat it because the deliciousness of the fruit? And maybe the biggest part, the biggest struggle for us. And God knows that if you eat of it, you will have knowledge and understanding that you don't have now. You, you will gain a, a type of wisdom that you didn't have before. You will expand. You will become something more than you are in and of yourself, especially under this idea that God himself is the one who rules and God is the one who created you. You, you, can, you can jump out there on your own and be something more than you are today. And that's a terrible struggle for us. Because all of us want to look at something like that and say, well, yeah, I mean, isn't in, in there this idea that I want to grow and I want to learn and I want to expand? And how far does that go? Of course, you know, all this was a cover for, for Satan, a cover for what you would lose. Because you will lose, if you choose that, then the relationship that you have with God now. And it was an incredible relationship. If you go back and read, I mean... They did their work, they had jobs, they, I mean, they had responsibilities, and in the evening they would walk around and they would talk with God. Would it get any better than that? I mean, whatever question you have, whatever you're struggling with, you know, God himself would come and walk with us and talk with us and explain to us and help us through things. I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable, and of course, when they do this and they forfeit that, they think it's unbelievable too. My goodness, what were we thinking? How, how did we get there. And so worship itself, the whole subject we're going to talk about, is so much more complicated. It, it's so much more involved with who we are than just the idea of even on Sunday morning we gather together and we sing some songs and we call them worship songs, and they are. But it's so much more involved than that. It, it's, it's who we are. It's our whole being. It's, it's how we see life. It's where our, our strength comes from, our worship of God. It's also where the, the ability to recover from the difficulties in life come from. They come from God. Our fears that overtake us, they certainly had them there. Uh, how are those fears going to be dealt with? It, it comes from worship itself actually is a part of it. That's why I put in your outline, it, the, the question is for every human being, we get to decide, we have a choice, what and why do you worship? <laughs> what and why do you worship? And, and the, the choice that we make to acknowledge God as who he is, to look to him in that way, and decide, no, that's who I'm gonna worship is powerful, but it's very complicated. I mean, it involves so much of our life because there are going to be things in life that you're going to look at and you're going to say, well, now, wait a minute. I think if, if I chose this, that would be the best for me. And yet God says, choose this. And now all of a sudden there's this conflict again, very similar to Genesis chapter number three. So what am I going to choose? What do I believe? Who do I worship in life? And the reason I say that is because you go all the way through the Bible and it talks so much about worship. And it doesn't just talk about, I mean, Adam and Eve, there's no indication 
you know, at least in the story, quickly that they sang. I think they probably did. But uh, it was so much more than that. It's how they, they looked to God himself and how they trusted God. Now, let me take a slight turn. I know you're going to think, oh, this is going to be a long sermon. Let me take a slight turn because I know there's an election coming up. And I get pressed all the time by people who say, when are you going to talk about the election? When are you going to tell people how they're supposed to vote? When are you going to go to... So just to let you know, to ease your, your, your fears, I'm not going to tell you how to vote. Uh, I don't see that as my job. Just to let you know. I know there are other people who do and other preachers who do and other people, preachers who would call me down for not doing it. So here's part of it. Here's how I look at it, just so you understand. If I told you how to vote, you would say, well, yeah because we pretty much see things the same way. So I'd be wasting my time telling you how to vote when I pretty much understand how you're gonna vote anyway and how you see things, not everything, but that's not my job. But I will tell you this, you should vote. You should vote. It, it, is, it is one of the privileges that we have in this country that we do not understand uh, that the rest of the world, for the most part, does not have. I know that there are some other countries that you have the ability to, to vote, but it's not the same as it is here. This was the experiment. This was the, the thing that everybody in Europe said would fail. It will not work. You cannot go to the people of the country and say, you get to choose your own representatives. They will make bad choices. All of Europe, all the rest of the world said, only the elite should make those choices, right? Only the elite should be allowed to make those choices because they're educated. They've proven they're the elite because they have more money, more powerful, more power. You can't let everybody in a country say, you, you are allowed to vote and choose your own representative. It will fail. You'll only have bad decisions, but 300 years, 400 years ago, uh, as people began to work on it, they believed it was worth the risk. You and I are worth the risk. But, so here's my little, only little push on you. If we don't vote, if we don't vote, what happens is we're missing the opportunity that we were given and the responsibility that we were given that somehow, you know, we would take that to heart. We would realize that the direction of any country, especially our country, is partly in our hands as we choose our own representatives. Uh, so anyway, that's my little uh, speech. And uh, so if you want to disagree with me afterwards, you're welcome to do that. But just that's my own little speech before we get back into this subject matter. And here's what John says um, in the gospel according to John. If you know John's uh, gospel, he's one of the uh, sons of Zebedee. He's one of the sons of thunder. And so he was a, actually, he's viewed mo mostly as a passive kind of guy, but he was not. And uh, his gospel is different from the other gospels. John starts his gospel by going back, in a sense, to the beginning. But he actually goes back further than Genesis in the beginning. And this is how he jumps into it. I want you to think about uh, what John says. Listen to these words. He says, in the beginning, say that with me. In the, in the beginning, he says, the word already existed. You remember in Genesis, this is in the beginning, God created. He's saying, in the beginning, this thing he calls the word already existed. It's the Greek word logos. And it, it, it's the word that they would use for um, a speech or for uh, knowledge or for a message that went out. It, it was for the Greeks, it had a divine sense to it. They used the word logos many times in that a divine knowledge, understanding, intelligence, where we get intelligent design from, you know, that, that caused everything to happen and where everything came from. So he says the word already existed, but listen to how he defines it further. Then he says the word was with who? God. Now, it, it, it's kind of funny because in this sense, it sounds like two separate things. Here's God and that intelligence, that idea and all was with God, but then he adds, and the word what? Was God. So wait a minute, there's a, there's a oneness and a unity to the word and to God himself. Verse two, he says, he existed in the beginning with God. So now he's, he's gone to a pronoun to identify a, an individual or some sort of personality. He existed uh, in the beginning with God and he created, and everything, I'm sorry, God created everything through who? Him, whoa. So is this, an, is this some sort of reference to the Trinity? Of course it is. The, the one God 
but then these different personalities that are there uh, in God. And he says, and nothing was created except through who? Now, this is why you hear people say, Jesus created everything, because he's going to identify, as he goes on in this chapter, the word becoming flesh and the word dwelling among us in the form of Jesus Christ, physically there. But he goes on and says this um, in verse four. He said, the word gave, I like this, the word gave life. So life comes from the word. Life came from Jesus himself existing beforehand with God and was God. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought, listen to this word, this is a great word, brought what? Light to everyone. In, in, in their day, light is sort of a metaphor for understanding. Sounds like Genesis 3, right? Understanding, knowledge. It's a metaphor for seeing things as they really are. It, it drives away the shadows. It drives away the, the false understanding. And so he, he's saying here that Jesus was the one who gave life. And his life was the light of men, was the understanding of who God was. Where, where, where they came from, who created them, who gave them life. His purpose and his, his meaning is all wrapped up in who Jesus himself was. He says in verse five, this is one of the best verses, right? The light shines in the what? Yeah, the light shines in the darkness. It, this is a reference to Jesus coming, absolutely. The light shines in the darkness, in our confusion, in our struggles, the light comes and he shines in the darkness and it says this, it says, and the darkness can never do what? Never extinguish it, can never stop it. I know that sometimes people feel, oh, you know. In fact, sometimes I, I, I hear people almost uh, put it on human beings and mankind that it's our job to make what Jesus did work or it gets shut down. That is not true, that is not true. It's our job to follow him and to trust him because he does what he does. In fact, he does what only he could do. I do understand why we would see it that way because our actions have consequences also. But listen, the light shines and the darkness will never conquer the light. It will never shut it down. We would understand that you know, just from, from normal life when, you know, when the lights come on, you know, it just cuts right through the darkness. That is exactly who Jesus is himself is and exactly what John is trying to say. I won't go through the rest of chapter number one, but I do want to make this kind of statement about who Jesus was and how that affects us, and I think it'll pop up on the screen here. Um, there is a life that cannot be explained by human chemical, I'm scientific, I love science, chemical or scientific measures. That is the life of Jesus, but that's also then this life that he came to give us and to bring us into. It cannot be explained by all the normal human types of things that we like to explain life by and kind of figure out how life works by. All those things, can, many of those things can be true, but it does not explain who Jesus himself is, who God is, and the life that he gave us. That's why we worship him, because he is the unexplained explainer of everything. He, he can do things that no one else can do. He can make changes that no one else can make in life. We, we understand that. So even when we project in life, you know, if this keeps happening, this is gonna happen. Well, that might be true if he did not exist, if he did not have plans, if he wasn't going to do some things in life. But what John is trying to make clear, it was a part of his faith, it was a part of his confidence. It was part of the change that occurs in John's life, especially after the resurrection of Jesus from his crucifixion on the cross. You, you, you can't beat him. No one can beat him. No one has ever been able to beat him. Would that change you if you knew that all the time, if you kind of held on to that all the time? Of course it would. You, you would approach life in a totally different direction if you understood that, if you could grasp that and hold on to it, and that's exactly why John is pointing it out. So if you jump down to, this is chapter number three, you probably know some of the verses out of chapter number three, but let me go through a few of them with you here. This is what it says in verse one. It says, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. So this is an educated man, 
What I refer to is the elite. Yeah, that's who Nicodemus was. He's a Pharisee. Um, he, he is educated in the Jewish law. Uh, he's very high and, and important. And it says after dark one evening, yes, yeah, so he comes at, at nighttime, not during the daytime. And as I've told you before, later, you know, had his own TV program. Um, Nick at night. Okay, just, we, okay, so uh, I know it's early. Uh, he came. He came to speak to Jesus. He comes at night and he comes to speak to Jesus. Rabbi, teacher, that's respectful. Rabbi, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Is that an amazing statement? We, we know that God has sent you to teach us. He says, your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. And that is exactly why Jesus, the Bible says why Jesus did miracles. He did them so that you would understand he is different than we are. He, even though he's there in human form, he's not like us. He has this ability to not be held by the limiting human laws, the laws of physics if they, that, that we go through. He is exempt from those. If he decides you know, that, that something's gonna happen, it's going to happen whether you can explain it or not. And it's one of the things that always kind of drives me crazy um, because I'm human, is that we look at anything that happens that is miraculous and we want to try to figure out, well, how did that happen? <laughs> it's kind of futile, isn't it? It's not going to happen according to the laws and to the rules that you and I normally live by and we, we have to live by. He didn't live by those rules. He didn't have to. This was a, a show of who he was in life. So I'll pick on one. So uh, one of the guys I listen to and I like, one time he had someone on there who was trying to explain that Goliath really had some sort of disease that made him grow real tall, and Goliath could hardly walk, and uh, he certainly couldn't carry his, only, his own shield and his uh, uh, spears, which is why he had somebody carrying them, and everybody was fooled by the fact that, you know, when they go into battle, that Goliath would defeat them. Listen, okay, that, that might explain it. It is totally bogus. None of the historical reports would, 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 would support that. Goliath was a giant. He was a warrior. He was feared. He not only could carry his shield and his spears, he could have picked up the guy and thrown him. I mean, giant is, Goliath is someone that you would back away from. There's no natural explanation for David conquering Goliath. It is because God was with him and caused him to do something that we look at and say, boy, can you imagine doing something like that, taking down somebody, somebody like that? We'll get back to David in just a minute. But this is what he goes on to say. He says in verse number three, Jesus replied. He says, um, I tell you the truth. Unless you are, say this with me, unless you're what? Yeah. It's, it's, a key, it's a key understanding. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. He's talking about something that's absolutely miraculous. Unless a change occurs in you, something inside is different. There's a, there has to be this shift inside of you from the normal way you see life and the normal way you pre, uh, approach life. Unless that occurs, you will not see the kingdom of God. Now, is he talking about the future? Is he talking about right there? I think all encompassing. You, you just won't get it. You won't see it. You won't understand it. This is very foreign to Nicodemus, he doesn't understand this. How, how in the world can you say that? I, I don't understand what you're talking about because Nicodemus is very smart, very learned, very educated. He would have had a lot of understanding of Greek culture. and everything. I mean, he, he, he just doesn't understand it and Jesus is fine because he knows that's part of why he came so that you could see something that otherwise you wouldn't, you wouldn't get. So here's what he says in verse four. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And do you think he's serious or do you think he's kind of, you know, poking the argument? Yeah, I think he's kind of poking the argument because Jesus is certainly not advocating that you would, you would go back and be born, you know, from your mother again. That's not what he's talking about. But Nicodemus, because he doesn't get it, he pushes in this way and sort of creates this false idea of what Jesus said when it is not what Jesus said. But that, you know, makes sense. So Jesus replied to him, verse five, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and what? It, see, it, it's a reference to something in here. 
It's, it's not just physical life. There's something that has to change inside of you in here. He says humans can reproduce only human life. But the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives birth to what? A spiritual life, a new life, a new awakening, a new understanding of who God is. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. And then Jesus gives an illustration that is absolutely, once again, just brilliant for, for our minds, for us to understand. He, he says the wind blows wherever it wants. That's kind of like saying the Spirit of God moves and does whatever he wants to do. You, you, you can't control it. I know we like to. You can't make it happen. You can't even predict it. I mean, just look at the weatherman, right? So, you know, it's, you, these, there are things beyond what we, what we understand. Just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. In other words, what he's saying is, listen, you can see the effects of it. Sure you can. We do all the time. And uh, maybe that was one of the things that influenced you. Uh, it did me as a young Christian, was when I saw the effects of someone deciding to trust and to follow Jesus Christ with their life, and I was just overwhelmed by it. I was like, whoa, because this is not even, it, it, in some ways, it's not even the same person that I knew before. There, something has changed inside of them that gives them a whole different confidence in life, a whole different direction in life. They, they see their circumstances. Something shifted, something changed that was powerful and for me was really attractive. I mean, I was like, man, and it was in between my junior and senior high school that in there is where I really decided that's what I want to do. I want to follow Jesus Christ with my life. I've seen enough that I believe, don't know everything, can't understand everything, but I see enough that I believe that. And I've often shared that I came back to high school my senior year and I was not the same person. I mean, I was, you know, seen my yearbook. You'd say, well, you look the same, yes. Yeah, so, uh, okay, still had red hair. I know it's gone, but you know, I, the... There was something different inside of me. Something changed in, in the way I wanted to do life. And the thing that stood out to me were there things that I would do as a junior in high school, all of a sudden my senior year, even my friends asking me, what are you, what are you doing? Are you okay? I said, I, you know, I just can't do that anymore. I don't know why. I just, something has changed. I can't go in that direction anymore with my life. Something has just changed in my life. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's trying to explain to Nicodemus. You, you can't define it. You can't make it happen. It would be foolish to try to make happen because it's something that God does inside of us. He, he makes us really from the inside out a different person that we still sin. We still do things we shouldn't. We still fall back in old ways a lot of times. But something shifts inside of us. And this is what it says in verse 9, Nicodemus. How are these things possible? I, 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 can, I can see it, what he's saying. I understand. I, I, I just don't know how to explain this. Oh, just to let you know, too, because, you know, a lot of times people will speculate on, on Nicodemus. If you read the Gospels, you know, at the end of Jesus' life, you will find out that Nicodemus actually does believe and becomes a follower. It just says it. For a long time, he is a secret uh, follower. He's a stealthy follower, right? Maybe you're like that. You know, I'm, I'm catching, I'm, but I'm not sure I want to come out and say something. And he does at the very end with uh, Joseph of Arimathea. They take a huge risk in taking care of Jesus' body. But here's what, he, here's what Jesus replied. You're a respected Jewish teacher. That means you're supposed to know. You're one of the elite. And yet you don't understand these things. You don't get it. You, you can't. You can't grasp what I'm saying. He says, I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe when I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned. But the Son of Man, this is one of the titles that Jesus would use of himself, has come down from heaven and as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, which has to sound incredibly strange 
uh, to Nicodemus because he's talking about during Moses' days when the snakes came and bit people and the solution was they made a bronze uh, image of a snake, put it on a pole. If you came to gaze upon the snake, you were, you were healed. It was miraculous. It's crazy. So what are you talking about, you know, as far as the snake is concerned? He'll find out later, of course, uh, when, uh, when Jesus himself is crucified. He says, um, he says, so everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. In, in verse 16, he says, for God loved the world, what? So much. This is why this sounds crazy, but what you have to understand is how much God loved the compassion that he had on mankind, the desire that God had to rescue and to save mankind. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him, that means trust in him, who put their hope in him, Everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. He adds in verse 17, God sent his son into the world, listen to this, not to judge the world. He didn't send him in the world to judge the world. He sent him into the world to save the world. In verse 18, he says, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light, remember what John talked about at first, this revelation, this new light that casts light on everything and makes you see things in a, in a different way. God's light came into the world, but people loved darkness more than they loved light for their actions were evil. We understand that. If your actions are evil, you don't want anybody to know what your actions are. You don't want them to see the evilness of your actions. He says, all who do evil hate the light and they refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. One last little piece, and I, I did put this in your outline also. Here's what worship of God does as far as saving you. Uh, worship of God saves you from two things in life that I think I just kind of put them in major things. First of all, it saves you from being too high and mighty and le living in your arrogance. And that is, a, that is a problem for us as human beings, right? We want to be lifted up. We want to uh, sound our own trumpet. We want to talk about how wonderful uh, we are and, and, you know, and, and bloviate ourselves. And then what happens is in our arrogance, we, we just run head into a wall that we never saw. It just, it, it tends to humiliate us. In fact, I love Old Testament, my favorite, it's my paraphrase of it, is, um, you know, when you get too high and mighty, the way you find out is all of a sudden your nose hurts because you fall flat on your face. You just don't realize you're headed toward the ground when you do it. And it's all because you've lost a sense of humility. You've lifted yourself up too high. It also saves you from this, though. Um, that worship will save you from being too needy in life and, and living in fear because we also understand that. We understand the neediness of life and sometimes we become too needy and we just, you know, we can't get over all the fears that we see in life and what, what Jesus does, what worshiping him does is it comes back and it gives us the strength not to let those fears overcome us. They, they should not overwhelm us because of who Jesus himself is and because we worship the God who, who came to heal us and to, to free us. Here's David. I know that I told you I was gonna get back to David. So this is a psalm, just a few verses out of Psalm 34 that David writes, and this is when uh, David has already killed Goliath. Um, he has been anointed and called to be the, the king of Israel. Saul, the current king of Israel, not real happy with that, you might think, yeah. And so he pursues David. He sends armies after David to take David's life, to eliminate David's life so he won't be king. And David is running around and he goes over to where the Philistines are. You've probably heard of them before. They lived more on the coast and that they're on the coast, they ruled. And uh, so David didn't want to get too close to the Philistines as he lived in that area. And so he pretended uh, to be insane, to be kind of crazy. And Achish is the... Uh, uh, the, the king of Gath, which is one of the Philistine city-states. And I love it. You can go read this. I think it's in 1 Samuel 21. He, he, they said, hey, what about this guy named David? And he said, he's crazy. That's what he says. And he says this. You can tell this is real because this is what we would say. Achish says, 
I got enough crazy people working for me already. I don't need another one. That's really what he says. I mean, that's, that's his language because he's like, that's the last thing I need is another insane person here, you know, uh, helping me out. So here's what David writes. Listen to his words and how fitting they are with the words that John gives us of Jesus himself. Listen to what he says. He says, I will praise the Lord when? At all times. Now this is, he's being pursued. He's, he's in a foreign land at this time. You know, th this is David in his height and in his, his low part of his life also. He says, I will, I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. He wants you to hear the same thing. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my, say it with me, all my what? Yeah, he, he overcame all those fears when I, when I looked to him and I called to him. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, David says, I prayed. What a great word of advice for us. In my desperation, sometimes the last thing we do or want to do is go talk with God. In my desperation, he says, I prayed and the Lord did what? He, yeah, wow. And he adds, and he saved me from all my troubles. Gosh. I mean, it's exactly what we want. And when we understand who God is, that's exactly who we want to worship in life. There's a song, I grew up with all the old hymns. There's a song, if you take a hymn book, most hymn books, it will be the very first song in a hymn book. Anybody got a hymn book with them? Okay, I'm sorry, we're wrong. <laughs> so I'm messing around, I know. So you know, if you, if you look in there, and there's this song, and I used to, I used to sing it back in the days when I, when I sang, and I would, uh, I would get up a cappella, and I would go, holy, holy, you know the song? Holy, y'all need a hymn book. Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 think of these words, merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Let me sing the second verse for you real quickly. I used to, in, in the days when I could sing better, I'd jump an octave right here. Holy, oh, but I'm not gonna do that because I, I <laughs> mess up here. But here's, what, here's the second verse that goes. It's, it's beautiful. It says, holy, 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 all the saints adore. The, yeah, he's our, our hero, our conqueror, all those who've been rescued. Um, all thy, my work shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Cherubim and seraphim, those are angelic beings, falling down before thee, perfect in power, in Love and purity. That's actually the end of the third verse, but I can find them. Sorry, in there. Yeah. yeah, man, that's who God is. That's why we worship Him. That's why, in the midst of you know just real life and, and everyday things, when when you think you know, but where is God? I've got life to live. But you need this time in your life. You need to stop. And you need to pray. And you need to run away at times and remember who God is. How much God loves you, and that all those who've been rescued and redeemed, they all sing the praises of the one who rescued, because they can't rescue themselves. And nothing on this earth, no government, no institution, nothing is gonna rescue us. Only God will rescue us. And as John says, and the darkness, the darkness can never stop the light, Jesus himself. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you do love us. 
And that we get a chance not only to know that, but we get a chance to, to sing of it, to speak of it, and even the privilege as we go through life, and all of us do, we go through life, troubles in life, difficulties in life, things that, you know, we have to deal with, things that we cannot explain, e even then, we have this wonderful privilege of looking to you and trusting you as we go through life that you're the one who watches after us. And even when we go through difficult times, that will not be the end of the story. That the light will penetrate the darkness. And the things that Jesus wants to do, he will do. And he will cause to happen. He always has, he always will. So that we have put our hope, our confidence in a real Savior, in a living Savior, who does what we call miracles because we can't explain them. So Lord, once again, we ask that you would do that type of a miracle in us, in our hearts. You would change us in here to see life differently because of who you are and what you've done. You've never put your hope in Jesus Christ. Just in this time together, you have the opportunity to say, Lord Jesus, I believe you, don't understand it all. But I do believe that, that you came and you gave your life to rescue me. Would you come and forgive me my sins? Fill me with a, a new spirit, your spirit, a new hope, a new joy, something that I know I desperately need and I cannot find anywhere else. Fill me with your life. In the name of Jesus, I pray.